Good afternoon, I'm Sarah Wheaton. I'm the senior health reporter here at Politico and I'm coming to you live from Auto World in Brussels. And for this fifth Politico Healthcare Summit, we had always planned to hold this in Brussels. That's one thing that was not changed. You know, some years we've been in Geneva or in Amsterdam, but this year when we planned this, we were like, Brussels is gonna be the center of the health universe. There's gonna be the cancer plan. They're gonna take on drug pricing and, and orphan incentives and shortages. And Brussels is just gonna be the center of the world. It's a huge year for health. Well, and then the pandemic happened, which made it a huge year for health everywhere, of course. For us here at Politico Pro Healthcare, it's always a huge year for health. But anyway, thank you for, for joining us for this year's Healthcare Summit. And I'd like to particularly thank our speakers for agreeing to share their expertise and points of view. And I would like to thank our presenting partners, Roche and Lilly, our supporting organizations, the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations, or FPA, as we know it familiarly, familiarly, and the European Patients Forum for making this event possible. So before we begin, I'd also like to mention a few housekeeping rules. Um, you can ask questions only through our Swap Card app, and you can find the instructions for that on the event website. Um, as always, we want to make this event as interactive as possible, even though we cannot interact with you in person here. Um, so don't hesitate to submit your questions and tweet about this event with the hashtag Politico Healthcare. And now to kick off this year's Healthcare Summit, um, let me welcome Dr. David Nabarro. He's the co-director of the Imperial College Institute of Global Health Innovation and Special Envoy on COVID-19 to the World Health Organization's uh, Director General. Um, so David, thank you for, thank you for joining us. Hi, um, my, my first question to you is, you know, we're here in sort of quasi-confinement in Brussels. I imagine you're in a similar situation in Geneva. And we have a really remarkable situation where we had this first emergence of this virus that swept quickly through the world. And nobody really knew anything about it, so they, it was a good excuse for policymakers maybe not having the best strategy for dealing with it. But then we always knew that after it died down a bit around the first uh, round of confinement, it would reemerge re in the fall, and we still are sort of in confinement. So, I mean, what's, what gives? What, what, how do you review policymakers in their second try when the conclusion was foregone? Cindy, isn't it interesting that we had that big acceleration earlier this year, and it was dealt with through really massive movement restrictions. The number of cases reduced dramatically, and then... There seemed to be a bit of surprise, quite honestly, Sarah, at the speed with which the virus has returned in Europe. And it is ferocious, the, the new uh, acceleration that we're seeing. And at the beginning, governments tried to minimise the amount of disturbance that they'd have to impose on their people. Uh, and then gradually we've seen, once again, movement restrictions reimposed. And then some of us are asking, well, is this what goes on until everybody is immunised with an effective vaccine that we'll go on seesawing between being in place with lots of movement restrictions and then uh, everything released and then back into movement restrictions? But that, that's not what's happening in East Asia. Very different situation. If you go to Thailand, go to Vietnam or 
even to New Zealand, Australia, uh, that there some kind of equilibrium has been reached. There is still the virus as a constant threat, still the possibility of it being imported as well. But what's happened is the countries have built into their normal operating systems a capacity to actually hold the virus back, hold the virus back through the way in which people behave, hold the virus back through the way in which health services and other facilities are organised, hold the virus back through the way in which the government organises, and that seems to be working. Of course, you get from time to time spikes, and sometimes they can be quite serious, as we've seen in South Korea. But you're prepared for it. You know what you've got to do. Very much local-level responses, everybody involved, integrated, and using the data about the virus as much as possible to help find your way. There are challenges. There's asymptomatic COVID, so how do you build that into your alert mechanism? There are challenges related to whether or not you, you can actually get everybody involved and everybody isolated when you need to, to interrupt transmission. But still, the systems are there and they're working. And that's the big surprise, Sarah, is how come Europe and the US have not managed to introduce those systems that will keep the virus at bay whilst at the same time enabling the economy to go on? So do we have mediocre politicians or mediocre citizens who don't want to follow the rules? Or what's, what's your diagnosis? Well, I wish there was a nice, simple, straightforward Here's the problem, here's the solution type thing, but it's something quite incredible. First of all, I think there has been a, a, quite a resistance by European countries to look eastwards and say, ah, there are lessons in East Asia. Uh, I think there's been a constant wish to present this as a bit of a debate between do we prioritise the economy or do we prioritise health? And that's been quite an easy political debate to unveil and to have as the basis for policy. And then I think there's just a, a, a real forgetfulness in much of, of, of Europe and, and other countries uh, in, in this latitude about just what public health is, that it, it involves communities being organised so that people look after each other. And that is that infrastructure, the honeycomb of the capacity to help people look after each other and actually link into their health, public health elements, that's just not here. And so, uh, in, in a way, I think what Europe will have to do in the coming weeks is to do a, a crash reconstruction of community-based public health to get it working, because I don't actually think that societies will tolerate a third period of movement restrictions and lockdown uh, in, say, February or March, they will be really fed up by then. So we've got to get the work done now, and that's what my colleagues and I are really pushing hard on as we speak. Well, but we're not going to need a third lockdown. In, in February and March, we have these vaccines. They're, like, over 90% uh, effective. What are you worried about? Yes. And I'm joyful, really joyful, about the incredible progress being made. We've had three vaccine uh, developments in the last two weeks, all announcing really incredible effectiveness. The Pfizer, uh, the uh, Moderna and the Russian Sputnik vaccines. Uh, and, and that's really good news. But let's remember that actually organising widespread uh, immunisation programmes is not easy. We've done it with smallpox, eradicated a disease, it's the only one. We haven't managed to eradicate polio yet. And with measles, we're slightly in reverse. We've got incredible coverage with measles, particularly in the Americas, but it's reduced because of vaccine nervousness and hesitancy. So I am delighted that we're at a point where companies can report very good effectiveness results, at least on some elements of effectiveness. We know they've got more to do on safety, and that it will be some time before the phase three uh, trials are complete, even on these three front runners, and then regulators can look at the results and say, okay, yes, we're prepared to give an emergency use authorization, or we're not. And that's necessary, it's got to be done. But then after that, 
Uh, the vaccine has to get to everybody who needs it. And, Sarah, I don't think it's going to be possible, even in Europe, to get widespread population immunisation, uh, even with these vaccines or others that might come on stream in the coming months. I don't think it'd be possible to do that within a year. And I think we will have to continue putting in place the public health measures to interrupt transmission. We'll have to continue to be encouraging people to wear masks and to do physical distancing and really good hygiene for at least another 12 months and probably for longer. Wow. Um, and before I go on to my next question, I want to remind the audience to submit your questions. Um, if you wait until the very end, then I won't have time to, to take all of those. Um, but um, um, on that note, you said that European governments need to spend the next few weeks doing kind of a crash construction of a, pub a better public health infrastructure. Can you give me some examples of, of what they need to be doing precisely? Well, first of all, uh, public health is about people's health, and at the centre of it are the people themselves. They are the solution to the challenges to health. They're not the problem. And what we've learned in so many infectious disease outbreaks is that you cannot have a long-term strategy which includes people changing their behaviour if they are not front and centre owning the response. And so trying to do uh, the necessary public health on the basis of restrictions uh, linked to perhaps disincentives like fines doesn't actually work in the long term. People need to do the right thing in the right place at the right time because that's what they choose to do. So if you make that a centrepiece of what the public health response has to be, then what has to come in alongside that? Well, absolutely essential is trust. Trust between people and state, people and employers, people and local organisations, people and any group to which they have an, uh, an affiliation. So putting people at the centre and concentrating on trust building is going to be really critical, as it is in dealing with any infectious disease. So I'm wanting to invite every European government to actually make a point of having people at the centre, make a point of having trust as a centrepiece of what's going on, and then linked to that is making certain that there's local capacity to respond to need with a honeycomb infrastructure of people's wardens who are looking after their health in every community just like we've got in East Asia, where actually most people in most communities know who they need to contact by telephone or text message if they're not feeling well or if they've got trouble with accessing whatever they need, food, medicines, or if they're just feeling absolutely miserable in their isolation. That honeycomb structure is key, and then linked to that is public health professionals who know how to interrupt chains of transmission and stop disease from spreading and then incident response teams that can be put in place quickly if there is an outbreak that builds up, but all based on local organisation. That's my super quick description of some of the things that I think are necessary. Well, it seems like an especially tall order in a time when trust on health matters has just broken down at every level, and that includes at the... At the global level, we've seen a lot of mistrust from, from some Western governments in the WHO. It led the US um, under Trump to declare that it was leaving. Um, we're seing uh, President, President-elect Joe Biden saying that he would rejoin the WHO. Many European countries have stepped up to say that they, notably Germany and, and France, have stepped up to say that they want to take more of a leadership role. But I'm thinking back to a conversation that I had after the election for Politico, where the conclusion was that the post-World War II order, which, which the WHO is sort of part of and American leadership is part of, it's just not really working anymore, even if 
even if Biden wants to restore some things. So I'm curious what you think. We've seen China say that they maybe want to start their own kind of global health infrastructure. We've seen some of the BRICS countries like Brazil say they might also want to leave the WHO. What is the future of global health and the WHO specifically, in your opinion? So, Sarah, let's start with people and what really means something for people everywhere in our world. If there's a common foe, then people will expect their leaders to work together to defeat that common foe. In this case, it's a, a virus. And we can't see it as anything else than a threat or a, a foe. And all of us totally depend on leaders pooling their national capacities and coming together with a unified response. I've never imagined in my professional life working on infectious disease, outbreaks and pandemics, I've never imagined that we'd reach a situation where leaders actually almost deliberately undermine the capacity for the world to respond to a threat due to a pathogen with unity and shared learning. It's pretty remarkable for me to see that. And which leaders, which, sorry to interrupt you, which leaders are you thinking of? Because I can imagine different parts of the world would intuit different leaders in your statement there. Well, in my role, I tend not to pick out individual leaders, but I hope that uh, those who are participating in this seminar will at least uh, know what I'm getting at when I identify leaders of major countries who have decided that they don't want to be part of the consensus in responding to this particular pathogen. I think you mentioned some just now, but it is my uh, absolute endeavor not to be picking out individual leaders by name. It doesn't help me in my role as WHO envoy, as you're going to be about to hear. You see, I actually think this phenomenon of leaders choosing to break away from the consensus and refuse to participate in the unified global response is a transient phenomenon. I don't think it's the way things are going to be in the long-term future. Of course, as a health professional who wants to see minimum possible suffering as a result of a pathogen, and who wants to see minimum possible suffering in the whole world as a result of this pathogen, I hope that those who've stepped away from things like the World Health Organization, either threatening to or actually seeking to leave, I hope that they and their nations will rethink quickly. Because this pandemic due to COVID is actually increasing very rapidly in its scale. The numbers of new reported cases each day are accelerating. The numbers of people dying each week are increasing. And that suggests to me that a redoubled collective effort by world leaders is essential. And as I watch what's happening in some advanced countries, I'm more and more convinced that that's what leaders are going to do in the coming weeks and months. I don't believe that the world order is somehow no longer relevant. Let me just jump. You see, we've got climate change occurring at this time. That, too, is an accelerating phenomenon. It's already hurting hundreds of millions of people each year. Just last weekend, we released a report on the health impacts of the climate crisis at the World Innovation Summit for Health, pointing out that unless health leaders can actually step up and be at the front of climate action, we're losing the potential of some really valued leaders who will be able to help get concerted action on climate everywhere. As we look across a number of the big threats to humanity, it's clear that they're accelerating. It's clear that they need concerted effort. And it's, I believe, it's self-evident that leaders of world nations over time will come to conclude that on behalf of their people, they must work together. It's just taking too long. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is my message to you and to anybody else is, can we do what ever is possible right now to speed up the point at which real collaboration happens. One example is the 
work that's being done on vaccination, a, a unified vaccination procurement system where advanced purchase is put in place with hedging built in so that poor countries can access vaccines to COVID when they become available. It's something called COVAX. 186 out of 193 countries have decided to join COVAX and they're putting in uh, some decent money, that, but much more money is needed. And this will provide a system that will enable all those who are participating to have access to vaccine. That's the way we ought to be going, not to a situation where we just get those who've got the most money coming to the front of the queue and others being behind. And that's what the World Health Organization stands for, but I think that's what the world wants. And I say it again and again, that's what people of the world want. They don't want leaders bickering. They want leaders working together for the common good. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought up COVAX because um, I just wonder if we can really call that a success. The, the European Commission has said that it's a member of COVAX and, and it has lent and given some money towards reserving vaccines for poor countries. But several NGOs have pointed out that the bottom line is wealthy countries have have reserved the vast majority of the early supply of vaccines. So is that really a success point? Well, it depends a bit on what you define as success. There are some people saying to me that success will only be possible when the world actually puts the interests of everybody, every human being, right on an equal footing. And when we've got things like vaccines, they go particularly to poorer people who are most at risk number one. But I think we're also used to imperfections. And we're going to say, well, OK, so it's not going to be that everybody is on the same footing. There will be some actions by rich nations to try to prioritise their own people. They, they actually will see this as an electoral necessity. So there are quite a lot of countries, as you're identifying, countries in Europe that are both buying their own vaccines through advanced purchase agreements and at the same time being part of COVAX. Well, I'd rather they were doing both uh, than only buying their own vaccines and not being part of COVAX at all. So at least we've got participation by European nations in COVAX at the same time as they are buying their own. It's not ideal, but it's a step on the way. And, and you know, Sarah, we, we can't, in, in public health, we can't just go on hankering for the perfect and letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. What we've got to be doing is saying to everybody, let's at least try with what we've got to go for a total global response and acknowledge, of course, that some will uh, also try to protect their own people with their own uh, national responses and, mm -hmm. and just live with that, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, we have a great question from, um, from Barra Bar Uman from, um, uh, on the app. Um, and the question is, why do we still see so little on investing in strengthening per the personal immune system through prevention and promoting a healthy lifestyle? And um, this is echoing in, in poor global regions with less impact, the question says. What's your take? I mean, I think this is a very important point. Of course, um, it would, it would be great if we could show that there are particular personal behaviours and particular uh, supporters to our own immune systems that we should be concentrating on. I've, I've seen all sorts of uh, publications advocating for particular vitamins or minerals or uh, behaviours to be put in place. And, and that work is still very much underway. The last thing we want to do is to suggest to people that there is a, a, a lifestyle choice that will make a lot of difference. But let me pick it out. Good nutrition, yes. Uh, physical exercise, yes. Outdoor living wherever possible, yes. And then trying to make certain that we do look after our mental well-being, absolutely, because that is very much threatened by uh, l l living with COVID. These are the sort of things that have to be an, at an absolute centre of this. And then adding in perhaps focusing on sleep and, and other aspects of, of our own internal well-being. So, yes, there should be more and more of that. But I don't want to suggest to anybody that those should be put at a higher priority than the personal preventive action, like physical distancing, masking, hygiene and self-isolation when sick. And I also want to add that public health capacity at the local level 
to help interrupt transmission is also vital. I think these three represent elements, things to keep ourselves healthy, uh, ways in which we behave so that we can reduce the risk of being caught by the virus, and then roles of government and local authorities and other institutions that empower us to do well. Taken together, I think that will give us a much stronger response capacity. Right, and I think looking at the... Uh, bouncing off from this, from this question, I think maybe it had a bit of a longer-term intent. In Europe, uh, we talk a lot about the failure to invest in prevention in general, and we're seeing issues with, with diabetes and heart problems and, and preventable cancers. All of those things, of course, put people at greater risk of serious illness from COVID, but they were also huge problems before. And, you know, what what is it going to take for political systems to, to really invest in those problems? Um, and is this emergency situation, is that going to set those longer term efforts back or is that going to be the crisis that gives them the impetus to really to really push on these? Well, if I was trying to represent all 7.7 .7 billion people in our world, I think that the pitch I would make to them right now is I believe in having strong foundations of public health in all societies. I believe that without those strong foundations, humanity is always susceptible to new emerging infectious disease agents. And I want to encourage every government to invest in a minimum public health capacity that will enable protection against these pathogens and I want to suggest that this should be in the manifesto of every political leader everywhere in the world. I believe that if that kind of manifesto idea were put forward at this time, whoever put it forward in most nations would get a lot of support. What I've noticed, though, is that when you're in the midst of this kind of pandemic, then people are quite focused on what's needed to prevent it. But then after several years, if you don't have another pandemic, then the reflection of its importance goes down and people don't maintain that degree of, of focus. I first got involved in pandemic prevention in 2005 during the period of bird flu, then again in 2009, the H1N1 pandemic, then again in 2014 with Ebola, in 2016 with cholera. And I've been very struck by the fact that the willingness of communities to prioritise public health seems to be much greatest when you're in the midst of a threat. So what we need to do now is to capture the pro-public health energy that exists throughout the world and just make absolutely certain that this is in, in, that is folded into political discourse everywhere and that we actually get a much more long-term political support for this because it won't happen without the political backing, but we need to keep maintaining the case to everybody. It's not expensive, but if you want to have viable economy, viable social life, viable uh, uh, opportunities for your children, you've got to have the public health basics in place, otherwise we're always going to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And and as you mentioned, uh, you know, we've gone through several pandemics before. You were responsible for writing one of the major reports that looked back at the world's response to, to the 2014 Ebola epidemic. We've talked a lot about lessons that have not been learned. Um, in the minute that we have left, are there any positive lessons that, that the global health community has actually taken in and implemented? I think the global health community is working together now like never before. I think Europe is supporting that collective action like never before, particularly through the World Health Organization. And perhaps most importantly, some of the poorer countries in our world, which followed the collective guidance of all the experts linked to the World Health Organization, are doing really well in their pandemic response. This is real strong hope for the future. You know, it's not every country in the world that's facing the kind of problems we have right now in Europe. And let's look to the countries that have done well and are still doing well because they know what a good public health response is and they are showing the way to the future.
Great, and I'm gonna toss in one um, very political question at the end. Um, uh, there's been some attention to the investigation into the animal origins of the virus, some accusations that China hasn't been cooperating as well as other countries would like. From your perspective as the special envoy on this issue, what are you seeing as far as China's uh, engagement? Well, first, I just want to say, uh, when you are trying to find out the origins of uh, an infectious disease, it usually is quite a time-consuming process. You need lots of people involved, and you can't really do it well when you're right in the midst of dealing with the outbreak. We saw this with Ebola. We've seen it with other diseases. So I don't think it matters that there's a delay. Secondly, uh, I have no evidence myself that any country is put dragging on this. There's a lot of work to be done. Uh, let's wait a bit before we pass the judgment. It's too early to conclude that uh, what you've just implied, foot dragging by any particular nation is happening. Uh, give, give us another year or two, and then we should decide. This is not super urgent for now, Sarah. This is important for dealing with the next one. What's urgent for now is this acceleration that we're seeing across the world and the need to get everybody focused in dealing with that. Well, quite a lot of patience you are demanding from us on several levels, but very well noted. And we thank you so much for joining us today, for sharing your time and thoughts. Um, and uh, that wraps up this particular session. Um, so the next session is our panel discussion on revolution in the EU's cancer approach. We'll be unpacking Europe's beating cancer plan, um, and that will be at 2.40 p.m. So feel free to just stay connected. Thanks so much.